Okay, so let's look at the interior of the kidney. So if you take a coronal section through the kidney, and you can see this quite obviously through the naked eye, you'll find a lighter, paler staining strip on the outside, which is called the cortex. If you remember, like in the suprarenal gland also, the outside was the cortex and the central area was the medulla. So you have an outer strip, lighter staining. This is the cortex. And then this area is the medulla, but it in turn is made up of triangular structures, which you can see, these triangles, which are known as pyramids, because when you kind of look at it in a 3D view, it looks like a pyramid, okay? And you can see this has a base, which faces the cortex, and an apex, which faces towards this part of the kidney, which is called the hilum, so it, you know, faces that. The apex of this pyramid is also known as the papilla. So it's called the papilla. You have about eight or ten of these pyramids. And in between the pyramids, you can see you have a bit of cortical tissue which kind of goes in and forms a, like a little column in between. So this cortical tissue goes in between and separates the pyramids. And this column of cortical tissue which is present is known as the renal column. So you can see it, it's called the renal column, okay? Now this area which is the pyramid along with half of one column, half of the other column and the associated cortex. Can you see this part like this? If you take this kind of thing, this is known as the lobe of the kidney. Okay, this is called the lobe of the kidney. Usually you have about 8 to 10 of these lobes. So the lobe of the kidney is the, med the pyramid with the adjacent cortical area on either the renal column on either side and on top is the part of the cortex. So that's called the lobe of the kidney about 8 to 10 and this area we did this earlier too this area is what is known as the hilum of the kidney and you can see these important structures the renal vein the renal artery and then the pelvis of the ureter they call it the renal pelvis now you we saw that these um the papilla or the apices of the pyramids were opening here towards the hilum Okay, so they open into a sort of a concave cavity which will come further down and actually finally lead into the ureter. So what they open into is known as a minor calyx. Now, just to understand how this minor calyx is formed, let me just give you an example of how the kidney um, uh, actually develops. So what I'm going to do is just take another slide. So when we are looking at the development of the kidney, so in the beginning, a area of the germ layer called mesoderm, so this is mesoderm, that develops into, you know, the kidney, the nephrons, and which, are, which have the renal tubule and the glomerulus. From below, let's say over here, is the bladder which is developing. So you remember the kidney opens into the bladder by means of the ureter, right? So this ureter actually begins to develop. As the bladder is developing, there's a little bud which develops. And so the ureter kind of grows up. So here's the kidney beginning to develop. And so there's no communication which has been established. And the ureter actually develops from below like this. When it reaches, it's reaching the kidney, it actually dilates. And that's what forms the pelvis of the ureter, which is why I said the pelvis of the ureter is a better term than rather calling it the renal pelvis. Renal suggests that it's part of the kidney. It's really part of the ureter. This pelvis in turn then divides into a few larger areas. So I'm going to kind of show it here. So here's the ureter. This becomes the pelvis. This divides into a few larger kind of divisions. These are known as major calyces. One is, sim one is called a calyx. It resembles something like, if you remember when you, if you ever did botany or biology, you know, you had a flower 
So let's say that was a flower like that. And you had a thing up here which this way, you remember this was called a calyx. Okay, so it comes from that probably. This major calyx, because it's large, this in turn actually then divides into two or three minor cal calyces. So these divide into two or three minor calyces. And it's these minor calyces into which this pyramid, the apex of the pyramid opens. So this is how it kind of goes in and reaches the kidney. Okay, so the nephron actually which begins here, so you we saw, we'll see the nephron, it travels down like that and then that opens into the minor calyx which leads into the major calyx which leads into the pelvis and then comes out into the ureter. Okay. So let's go back to this slide here. So here this part, the first part you're seeing, this is what is called the minor calyx. This leads into the major calyx and the major calyx leads into the pelvis. But developmentally it started from below upwards. You, you understand what I'm saying? But when urine is formed, it will pass all the way through. It will come first into minor calyx, then into major calyx, then into the pelvis and down into the ureter and all the way down into the um, bladder. Okay. Now let's look at renal blood supply. And this is important because remember the function of the kidneys is to filter the urine. So in order to filter, uh, sorry, filter the blood and form urine. In order to filter the blood, you need to have blood vessels and those blood vessels somehow must connect with um, the structural and functional units of the kidney. So let's look at the renal blood supply. So this kind of gives a very nice um, picture. So we'll go up to this point here and then later we'll come back to this. So from the aorta, you get the renal arteries which are um, formed, the right and left renal arteries. Now, it just so happens that the aorta is more towards the, the aorta is more towards the left of the median plane. So, this is the aorta. The left renal artery is shorter. The right one will be longer because the aorta is more towards the left. And when you look at the renal veins, which drain into the inferior vena cava, so here we have renal veins which will drain into the inferior vena cava. The right one is shorter and the left one is longer, okay, because of the way they are placed. So that was just a kind of side or little tidbit. So from the aorta, the renal artery comes off. The renal artery then divides into five branches which are known as segmental artery because in the kidney, just as in the lungs, we had bronchopulmonary segments. In the kidney, we have what are called vascular segments. There are five of them. So we have five segmental arteries. So up here, if you look at, you can see these are segmental arteries. So this is the main renal artery giving off these segmental arteries. These segmental arteries then pass in between these lobes of the kidney. So they form what are known as interlobar artery. Lobe is always bigger than a lobule. So they go and become what are known as interlobar artery. So these in between are called interlobar arteries. These interlobar arteries travel this way and they join one another so that between the cortex and the medulla, you have kind of an artery which is forming a, like an umbrella all the way through. It forms like an arch and that is known as the arcuate artery. Okay, so interlobar forms arcuate artery because they join one another. From the arcuate artery, you get arteries which go straight out and they kind of appear to be radiating into the cortex. So these are called cortical radiate arteries or also they used to be called and many books refer to them still as interlobular arteries. So here these are the interlobular arteries. From these interlobular arteries we get these, this artery called the afferent arteriole. So from this you get arteries coming off. They are much smaller so they are known as afferent arterioles. And this afferent arteriole leads to a capillary plexus, which is known as the glomerulus. Okay, and we will see this glomerulus later. So you have what you have to remember is that the afferent arteriole leads into the glomerulus. And also notice from the glomerulus, another arteriole comes out, which is called the efferent arteriole. Okay, um, we probably won't have time, but in your notes, you have a, a video which shows you how this renal blood supply is. So kind of take a look at that. Okay.
So now let's look at the functional and structural unit of the kidney and that is something known as the nephron. Just as you know, remember in the nervous system, the neuron was the functional and structural unit. So here it's the nephron. This is the one which actually forms the urine in the kidneys. The number is constant at birth and it has two parts to it. One is the kidneys have to, we said they have to filter blood. So first you have to bring blood into the kidney, which has to be filtered. That is brought about by this capillary plexus, which is called the glomerulus. So the nephron consists of the glomerulus and that is the filtering end. That is from where the blood is filtered. Now when it, blood is filtered, it has to be received into something. And what it is received into is called the renal tubule. So that's the receiving end of this nephron. So the nephron consists of the glomerulus and the renal tubule. The renal tubule in turn is broken up into four main parts. The first is known as the glomerular, uh, the, sorry, glomerular capsule or also known as the Bowman's capsule. So this here, it's a cup shaped uh, structure, which look, which is almost exactly like, think of the cup shaped structure somewhat like a baseball glove or a, you know, mitten. So when you look at a baseball glove and if you were to put your hand, there's a cavity inside that glove, right? And imagine if you were holding a baseball in the in your palm with, uh, when you have that glove on. So you can understand then that here you have this glove on, okay? So your fingers are inside. So this part is the part which is going to be in contact with the baseball, right? This is the cavity of the glove in which your fingers are. And then this is the outer layer of the glove, which would be on the outside of your hand, right? So similarly, this glomerular or uh, Bowman's capsule has this inner layer, which is in contact with the baseball, which we call the glomerulus, which is the filtering end. So you can see how the glomerulus is there. So this is the, this is how the cup would be. So this is known because it's in intimate contact with the ba with the glomerulus. This is known as the visceral layer. Remember anything we had when it was in contact with an organ or a visceral structure, we called it the visceral layer. This is the space called the Bowman space or capsular space or glomerular space. And this layer on the outside would be known as the parietal layer. Followed? Okay. So here you have the glomerulus, which is where the capillary plexus is, which is the where blood will go and it will filter. It will be filtered through that visceral layer and it will go into the Bowman space. From this Bowman's capsule, you, the next part is what is called a highly convoluted part of the renal tubule, which is known as the proximal convoluted tubule because it's present proximally. It's called proximal convoluted tubule. This tubule then dips down and can you see it kind of forms a hairpin bend like a loop. So this is known as the nephron loop or also called the loop of Henley. It is also known as the loop of Henley after the person who discovered it. Since this nephron goes down, since this loop goes down and then travels up, the part which goes down is called the descending limb and the part which is going up is called the ascending limb. And in certain areas, you can see this part is really thin. So this is often known as the thin segment. And this area is thick, so it's called thick segment. That's just, it depends on the wall, okay? So in the thin segment, it'll have thin squamous cells. In the thick segment, it'll be cuboidal cells. And then the loop of Henle goes up and becomes convoluted again, where it's called the distal convoluted tubule. So you can see the parts of the renal tubule are the Bowman's capsule with that capsular space. That space leads into the lumen of the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle into the distal convoluted tubule. So this is the renal tubule. Many such distal convoluted tubules, which are parts of nephrons, many of them will then open into a duct, which is known as a collecting duct. So you can see these are all the cut ends of many nephrons whose distal convoluted tubules will join them. Many collecting ducts will actually join one another and they will form larger um, ducts, which are known as papillary ducts. So these collecting ducts, many of them will join and they'll form what are known as papillary ducts. And as the name suggests, the papillary ducts are what will pass through the papilla of the 
um, pyramid and open into the minor calyx. Okay. Now we have another term. So we said the nephron was the glomerulus and the renal tubule and the renal tubule consisted of this, these four parts. Now if we took just, the ne just this part of the entire nephron, that means just the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule, just this part, this is also known as renal corpuscle. So sometimes when you read the word renal corpuscle, you're going to say it's a, just a part of the nephron which includes the glomerulus and just the beginning of the renal tubule, which is the Bowman's capsule, okay? So it has a special name given to it, which is the renal corpuscle, and that's where filtration occurs. Most of the nephrons lie in the cortex, most of them, about 80% of them lie in the cortex. So in other words, most of them will lie here, so they'll all be here, so they'll dip down and come back here. But there are a few nephrons which begin very close to the medulla. So they may be a little bit low down here. So with the result, the loop of Henle will dip into the medulla. And these all open into the collecting ducts. So collecting ducts lie both in the cortex and medulla because they come down and that's how many of the collecting ducts join and form papillary ducts, which are the ones which will pass through the papilla and open into the minor calyx. Okay. So let's look at the structure of the nephron. The renal system consists of the kidneys, the connecting arteries and veins, and the urinary tract. The kidneys are paired organs. Outside the peritoneal cavity and back of the abdomen. One on each side of the vertebral columns function as the body's excretory organs, eliminating the body's metabolic waste products by filtering the blood. Substances that are needed or are present in our filter blood and via the urine in being expelled through the urine. The kidneys also selectively reabsorb those substances that are needed to maintain the normal composition of the blood by adjusting blood composition. The kidney maintains pressure for valium, chloride, potassium, calcium, hydrate, and pH, and eliminates products of metabolism such as urea, uric acid, and creatinine. The medial border of the kidney fissure, where the blood vessels, nerves, and ureters connect to the is composed of up to 18 lobes. Each lobe is composed of nephron. nephrons. Are the Functional units at each key and a system of tools. This is a unique high pressure massive capillary blood. The glomerulus is encased double wall capsule called Bowman's capsule. The space inside the capsule and surrounding the glomerulus is called Bowman's space. Fluid is filled filtered from capillary blood into Bowman space through the glomerular filtration membrane. The glomerular filtration membrane consists of three layers of wall, the basement membrane and the This membrane allows us from the pass through, but not all. The fluid that is filtered from the capillary blood Bowman space is called filtrate and forms the primary urine. Then do fuel system Tubule. Some substances are made as part of the urine formation, and these are absorbed out of the filtrate and back into the blood. Before reaching the urine, a highly coiled segment called the proximal Bowman's capsule, and where only absorption of nutrition important substances takes place. A thin loop structure called the loop of Henle, which reabsorbs water and ions from the urine and plays a role in controlling the coiled crystal conduit, which regulates potassium, sodium, and pH, and where further dilution of the urine takes place. And the collecting tubule, which joins with several tubules to collect the filtration, takes 
include the collecting duct like this one did in the renal tubule most don't so that's why i haven't included it in the re in the renal tubule okay now let's look very closely at the renal corpuscle which was the glomerulus and the bowman's capsule because there's a very important uh, apparatus present there which is known as the juxta glomerular apparatus jg stands for juxta this is juxta glomerular apparatus juxta meaning close by so let's look at it the function of this jg apparatus why is it important is because it regulates blood pressure and also regulates filtrate formation you just saw that blood is filtered so it regulates how much blood will be filtered how much urine will be formed how much solutes will be present and so on so that's what it is meant by regulating blood pressure and filtrate formation it is made up of three parts two are really important they are called the jg cells and here if you look at it so here you can see this is the afferent arteriole which is remember we saw how we have the arcuate arteries which gave off those cortical radiate arteries which gave off afferent arteriole so you can see this is the afferent arteriole which goes to form this capillary plexus called the glomerulus and from this plexus the efferent arteriole comes out so here i want you to pay attention to two things one is can you see that the diameter of the afferent arteriole is greater than the diameter of the efferent arteriole can you see that it's quite clear in this picture there's a reason for it because it is it's very similar if you think of it to the lymphatic system you remember how you had many more afferent vessels and very few efferent vessels so what happened the lymph kind of dammed up it kind of backed up in the lymph node so that it would take time to come out and the you know the cells would be exposed to any pathogens or debris inside here think of it so a blood is going in much faster than it's coming out so what happens is that in the glomerulus a pressure is built up which is called, which is fluid pressure which is known as hydrostatic pressure because of this fluid pressure fluid can actually pass out through the glomerular capillaries into this bowman space and the reason they can pass out is obviously they can only pass out if you have pores between the glomerular capillaries and you have pores between the visceral layer of that bowman's capsule so you remember the visceral layer of the bowman's capsule was surrounding the visceral layer was surrounding the glomerulus so this is the parietal layer as you can see parietal layer of of glomerular capsule and when it turns around and it completely this was the part i said where your glove was fitting the baseball this is the visceral layer and the visceral layer actually has special cells which are known as podocytes so you can see here and they form the visceral layer so passing between the endothelium of the capillary between this visceral layer and the fused basement membrane that is what forms the filtration membrane so that's what forms a filtration membrane and through that is what the blood is filtered and passes into the bowman space so both this capillary endothelium plus these cells of the visceral layer they have little holes in them tiny little pores which allow fluid to be filtered or blood to be filtered and that's why you need a hydrostatic pressure so it's imagine like a coiled water hose here with tiny little holes so if the pressure in the water hose is high then only filtration will occur understand okay so now in the afferent arteriole the smooth muscle cells of the afferent arteriole you have these smooth muscle cells are highly granular and those are known as jg cells so these are the smooth muscle cells in the afferent arteriole so these are smooth muscle cells very granular because they secrete a hormone called renin and because blood flows through it they monitor the blood pressure so if blood pressure is low automatically it means that uh, less blood is flowing through that these cells will be activated they will secrete renin and what will happen you remember when we did endocrine system we talked of renin angiotensin mechanism so that will go and cause angiotensin to be secreted and that makes angiotensin acts on aldosterone 
And what aldosterone does is it causes sodium and water to be reabsorbed. So automatically your blood volume and blood pressure goes up. You notice that? If your blood pressure is normal, then this renin is not stimulated and you don't need to reabsorb more water. Okay, so that's the purpose of the JG cells. Then very close to the JG cells, what happens is this ascending limb of the nephron loop and the adjacent distal convoluted tubule, it comes very close to the afferent arteriole. So some of the cells of the ascending limb and the distal convoluted tubule, most of them are cuboidal in nature, but some of them get really tall and they form special cells which are known as macula densa cells. So these are of the ascending limb and the distal convoluted tubule. It comes very close to the afferent arteriole. So they form these special cells. What they do, because only filtrate is passing through that, not blood, because in the tubule it's the filtrate. So they monitor the solute content. They make sure, is the so amount of solutes present, is it normal, is it too much or too little? And based on what it is, it will kind of act accordingly. It will stimulate the afferent arteriole to do what is needed to be done. So that those are the macula densa cells. And then in between this macula densa and the afferent arteriole, you have these special cells present here, which are called mesangial cells or extraglomerular mesangial cells, which actually kind of form a connection between the two. It allows the macula densa and the JG cells to talk to each other, to communicate with each other. Okay. So these two are very, very important because the final function of the kidney is to produce urine and to regulate the volume and composition of blood, right? So this JG cells, as you can see, it monitors blood pressure to make sure it decides whether more or less should be filtered and the macula densa checks on the solute content. So because that automatically will, uh, will uh, affect the blood composition. Now let's go back a little bit to the renal capillary bed and for this I want to show you this slide. So I'm going to delete this. And we're going to go to this slide. So you remember we did till this part. So we have the arcuate artery forming the cortical radiate artery or interlobular which gave off the afferent arteriole. The afferent arteriole forms the glomerulus. And the glomerulus exiting from the glomerulus was the efferent arteriole. Now you need blood to come back out, right? So you have to form the same. You have to form the cortical radiate veins. You have to form the interlobular arcuate and so on and finally come out. So how does blood get out of the kidney? So because at one, both ends you have arterioles, right? So somehow you have to get to a vein. This efferent arteriole actually breaks up into a network of capillaries which is known as peritubular because they're very close to the tubule or we'll see they break up into capillaries which are straight and long called vasa recta. The word recta means straight, rectus means straight, vasa meaning blood vessels, straight blood vessels and I'll show you a picture of these. These drain into cortical radiate veins and arcuate vein and that's how it comes back out. So let's look at this picture here. So here you see this. And I want you to pay attention to the proximity between the renal tubule and the blood vessels because there's a reason why they are lying so close to each other because this is how it helps the kidneys form urine. So if you look here, so here is the afferent arteriole. So up here in the, the cortical uh, nephrons. So here's the afferent arteriole forms the glomerulus. This glomerulus then is... The exit is through the efferent arteriole. So both are, an arteriole feeds it and an arteriole exits it. And now again, this efferent arteriole, notice it breaks up into a capillary plexus. This capillary plexus is completely intertwined around the renal tubule. So it's very close to them. So this is therefore called peritubular. Peri meaning going around the tubule. So it's called peritubular capillary plexus. So this is there in those nephrons which are high up, which are in the cortex. If you look at nephrons, which are, remember I said that about 80% were in the cortex, but 20% were very close to the corticomedullary junction. So these are known as juxtamedullary nephrons. So their loops of Henle kind of dip way down into the medulla. So here notice what the juxtamedullary nephrons do. So again, you have an afferent arteriole glomerulus, then you have the efferent arteriole. 
But the efferent arteriole, instead of breaking up into a peritubular capillary plexus, actually it breaks up into long, straight blood vessels, which are known as vasa recta. Notice that? Okay, just a little difference, just the way the blood vessels are. And these blood vessels, in turn, will drain into, sim just similar to this, they drain into the interlobular or cortical radiate vein, which goes into the arcuate vein, and then interlobar, and then segmental and out of the kidney. Okay, so I want you to see this uh, proximity because then when we do renal physiology, you will understand how substances can pass from the tubule into the blood vessels or from the blood vessels into the tubules because they are so close to each other. Okay. Okay, let's answer a few questions. What is the need for the glomerulus to have an arteriole feeding it and one exiting from it? Yes, to allow for filtration pressure. Remember, if, if, if it was an artery and then a, just a vein, remember veins have very sluggish blood flow. So blood will just pass out very, very normally and veins usually have larger diameter. So you're not going to have this hydrostatic pressure. So here, because you have both an artery and on either end and one is larger than the other, you have this buildup of filtration or hydrostatic pressure. And that's what allows the filtration to occur. Is this a true or false statement? This is a true statement and again that's why pay attention to these pictures. Remember the afferent arteriole broke up into a capillary plexus called the glomerulus. So that was the first one. And the efferent arteriole also broke up into a capillary plexus called the peritubular capillaries here or here too. Only the name was different. It was called vasa recta. Okay. So both of them break up into capillary plexuses. So this is a true statement. Okay, so here, another review. The JG cells are smooth muscle cells in the afferent arteriole. So what do you think they would be able to sense? In an arteriole, what is passing through? Blood. Right? So they will sense blood pressure. It's in the tubule that you have the filtrate which passes through. So it is the other, the macula densa, which is part of the DCT and ascending limb, that senses solute content. So instead of trying to memorize, think of it this way. So here we have, and again let me change my color. So here we have the glomerulus. And here's the Bowman's capsule, which leads into the proximal and, you know, so on, the loop of Henle and come back out like this. So blood is flowing through here. And here's where those JG cells are. So what is passing through them? Blood. So they can sense blood pressure. When this blood gets filtered, it forms a filtrate, which you saw in the video. And that filtrate is what is passing through here. So now in the macula densa, you will be able to sense solute content in the filtrate because you don't have blood actually going here. The filtrate is plasma minus the cells and um, proteins. Got that? Okay, so that's how you're going to remember. Let's look at a little histology. So the glomerular capsule, the first one, the glomerulus, of course, is a capillary plexus, which is made up of endothelial cells with a basement membrane. The glomerular capsule, again, it has to be very thin because the filtration membrane, you remember how you have the respiratory membrane. So similarly, the filtration membrane has to be very thin so that it allows substances to pass through. Again, it is made up of thin epithelium, which is squamous in nature. <clears throat> 
In the case of the visceral layer, these cells, the squamous cells have a special name. They are known as podocytes because they have these little foot processes. And these foot processes actually have little slits in between them. You can see these slits. And here you can actually see the entire, um, you can see the entire filtration membrane up here. So you can see, see the fenestrated. Fenestrated means things which have gaps. Epi endothelium of the glomerulus. You can see the fused basement membrane and then the visceral layer of the Bowman's capsule. So this is extremely thin. So blood can filter quite easily through this and come into the Bowman space. Next is the proximal convoluted tubule. When you look at the proximal convoluted tubule, here a lot of activity goes on. A lot of secretion and reabsorption goes on. So um, this should re really read reabsorption. So secretion and reabsorption goes on. And so therefore you need microvilli. So you'll have microvilli which help in reabsorption. So the cells are very, very tall. So usually you will find that the here you cannot see the lumen quite well. And you remember microvilli give a brush border appearance we saw in the small intestine. So here also you'll have that little fuzzy brush border appearance. So these cells have this brush border appearance. The lumen is extremely small. And there are more proximal convoluted tubules than there are distal convoluted tubules. So these are more in number, the proximal convoluted tubules. And because the cells are so tall, the lumen is much smaller. It also stains a little bit more deeply because you have a lot of mitochondria, a lot of activity going on here, mitochondria and Golgi body and rough endoplasmic reticulum. So that's why it stains more deeply. Distal convoluted tubules, fewer in number. They usually have cuboidal cells. So the lumen is much larger. And these are usually clearer, light staining, because they don't have that much, um, the, that many mitochondria and uh, Golgi and rough endoplasmic reticulum. Though even here you have reabsorption and secretion occurring, but most of it occurs here in the proximal convoluted tubule. When you come to the loops of Henle, the thin segments look exactly like very similar to capillaries, only they don't have blood in them. So they have thin squamous cells. And the thick segments and collecting ducts look, again, very similar to the distal convoluted tubule. So they have um, ta uh, cuboidal cells. You might uh, find they are light staining. The lumen is much larger. And so sometimes it gets a bit difficult to tell which is the, uh, unless you have a longitudinal section, it might be difficult to tell which is the thick segment and which is the collecting duct. So here we finished with the kidney. So you've manufactured the filtrate. It's passing through and now it comes into the ureter. So the filtrate has come into the ureter and then we call it urine by that time. So the function of the ureter is to transport the urine from the kidneys into the bladder. And it has a very, very thick muscle wall. So it is able to do this because of peristalsis. So that muscle kind of peristalsis and the urine passes slowly because if it wasn't due to peristalsis, if it just sort of plopped straight into the bladder, your bladder will get full really, really fast. So first, the minor calyces receive the urine from the collecting and the papillary ducts. It then goes into the major calyces. So from the minor, it goes into the major calyces. As you can see here, the collecting ducts opening through the papilla into the minor calyx then into major calyx, then into the pelvis, and then into the ureter. You can notice the ureter lying both in the abdomen and in the pelvic cavity, half and half. It enters, where the ureter enters the bladder wall in an oblique fashion. What I mean by that is that it actually passes, a, a part of it is lying through, passes through the bladder wall and this is rather important because when the bladder contracts to push urine out through the urethra, you don't want urine to go back into the ureter. If it went back, you know, it would cause reflux. So what happens is since it passes obliquely through the bladder wall, so if I was to show you the bladder wall like this and it's passing obliquely through the bladder wall, when it contracts, it kind of acts like a valve. It pushes on this oblique passage and closes it off and so it prevents reflux. One important um, 
relation, anatomical relationship in the females is that the ureter is very closely related to the uterine artery. So as this ureter crosses this area, which is known as the pelvic brim, so when it goes from the abdomen into the pelvis, it crosses the bony pelvis, the hip bones, at that part where it crosses is called the pelvic brim. And when it enters here, it's very closely related to the uterine artery. So here, in fact, they're showing you the uterine artery. I don't know if you can see, but that, that's where they're showing the uterine artery. So extremely closely related. So one has to be very careful in females, especially when you do something like hysterectomy, because when you're removing the uterus, the procedure of removing the uterus is called a hysterectomy. You have to tie off the uterine arteries. Because of this close relationship, you always have to be sure that you're not tying the ureter also. Because you can understand if the ureter is tied off with the uterine artery, you remove the uterus and you're all happy. But what will happen? The urine can no longer flow into the bladder. So you'll end up with a complication of renal failure. You understand that? So this relationship is rather important. Oh, and another thing I wanted to show you here is that where the pelvis of the ureter, where it joins the ureter, there's a slight narrowing at that point. The area where it's narrowed is known as the pelvi-ureteric junction or also called the ureteropelvic junction. So it's a narrow area. And this narrowing sometimes when people have kidney stones or what are known as renal calculi, um, those can actually get stuck in that point. Wherever there is a narrowing anywhere, it can get stuck in that area. Here's the histology of the ureter. Since it's extremely muscular, you will find when you look at it under the microscope, the lumen is kind of thrown into folds like that. So it looks very star-shaped, which we say is a stellate lumen. It is lined by transitional epithelium, which is particularly conducive to the ureter and the urinary bladder because transitional epithelium is one of those epithelia which is capable of stretch. So it can accommodate, you know, it can stretch and um, accommodate sort of urine, the volume of urine. Also, the top layer over here, you can see this is the layer which is in, which will be in contact with the lumen. On the top layer of cells, you have a substance secreted, which is called the cuticle. So if I was to show you the cells, it's, so it's a multi-layered epithelium, so it's protective. And on the top layer of cells, you've kind of got a little sort of like it looks a little bit like a membrane which is called the cuticle and the cuticle is important because this is impervious to urine impervious means it does not allow urine to pass because urine is mainly water so it does not allow urine to pass through from here and into the bladder wall after all water can pass through easily right so it prevents that so it's actually like it acts like a, a water blocker so that's one of the reasons why transitional epithelium is very, very well suited to lining the ureter and the urinary bladder. One, capable of stretch. Second, it's stra it is stratified, so it's protective. And third, it has this cuticle which makes it impervious to urine. This area here is the submucosa. So just loose connective tissue. And then you have this thick muscle layer. So there's a longitudinal and a circular muscle. And this is what is responsible for the peristalsis and then the outermost area is connective tissue which is known as adventitia. So let's look at, um, let's review the ureter. So where do the ureters lie? Very good. Both abdomen and pelvis so in, could be injured in either place. And the ureter has a very thick muscle wall that allows. Peristalsis for transport of urine. Now think of this one. So suppose there is a, cal a calculus or a stone 
at a point where the ureter enters the pelvis from the abdomen when here when i'm using the word pelvis i'm not talking about the pelvis of the ureter i'm talking about the pelvis or pelvic cavity of the body uh so suppose there's a there's a little block there so this will cause urine to back up into all of the following regions except Very good. Yes. So everything above will back up. So the abdominal part of the ureter will be blocked. Will the urine will go up minor, major calices, but it hasn't yet come into the bladder because the block is before the bladder. So urinary bladder will not be affected. Good. Let's look at the urinary bladder. Extremely muscular organ. Very very muscular. It's a pelvic organ. That means it lies in your pelvic cavity. So again once again I want you to be a uh, very sure when we say pelvis when I you know either we would use the word renal pelvis or ureteric pelvis when I'm referring to the pelvis of the ureter or, you know but otherwise when we just use the word pelvis we mean the pelvic cavity which is you know inside your body though it's a ventral body cavity So this is a muscular pelvic organ found in the pelvic cavity except in children and if you've noticed little children they tend to be uh, you know till about 6 years old little children have a pot belly they look like you know they have a little paunch that's because the bladder is an abdominal organ in them it takes time for the bladder to actually descend into the pelvis in us in adults or after 6 years beyond that in uh, it is a pelvic organ the only time it becomes abdominal is when it's distended so you can sometimes feel your bladder above the pubic symphysis when it's you know really distended okay so it has if you look at it it has a superior surface which is this on the top it has lateral surfaces which will be on the sides okay and then it has a posterior surface which will be a surface at the back so it kind of looks um somewhat like a pyramid so if you kind of look at it from the top it looks somewhat like a pyramid like this so this is how the bladder would look if i'm looking at it from the side so this is the superior surface this is one lateral surface there'll be another one on that side and this is the posterior surface if this is anterior and this is posterior i'm looking at it from the side are you understanding how i've drawn this picture okay so here so i'm drawing it from the side imagine i take this and turn it to the side So here is the superior surface, right? The top of the bladder. Here's one lateral surface. The other one will be on that side and here's the posterior surface and this is where the bladder will turn down and come into the bladder neck, okay? So this is superior, this is one lateral, that's another lateral on that side and here's the posterior surface which is also called the base. The superior surface of the bladder is covered by peritoneum, so you can see this. So if you look inside we'll go from inside out if you look inside the bladder we'll notice that most of the bladder tends to be kind of looks folded especially when the bladder is empty these folds are known as rugae just like we see in the stomach but there is a certain area of the bladder on the posterior surface where the mucosal lining looks very very smooth so it looks triangular that area is called the trigone so you can see this area called the trigone so it's triangular and in this trigone you have it's 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 like a triangle so you have three sort of points you you have two openings of the ureter the right and the left ureter so you have two ureteral openings and the lower apex is what is called the urethral opening so this is what will lead into the urethra so this lower opening is also known as the internal urethral sphincter or also called internal urethral opening this is also the region where the bladder continues into the urethra so it's also called the bladder neck or it's also known as the internal urinary or urethral orifice all these are the same for this opening here so it's This region is called the bladder neck and it leads into the urethra so it's called the internal urinary or internal urethral opening or internal urethral orifice 
or also called this is where the internal urethral sphincter is going to be present okay so the trigone the three openings that you see will be two urethral and one urethral opening and that is smooth but the rest of the bladder is uh, the mucosa is kind of thrown into folds the wall of the bladder is very thick made of smooth muscle it's an organ it has a special name it is known as the detrusor muscle so the wall of the bladder extremely thick the muscle runs in different directions and this is called the detrusor muscle and this detrusor muscle at this point where this internal urethral orifice or opening is it gets thickened in that area to form an involuntary sphincter which is called the internal urethral urethral or internal urinary sphincter urethral and urinary are kind of interchanged at this point so it's thickened there and it forms an involuntary sphincter because this is smooth muscle and then the outermost layer of the bladder is the adventitia now here in the, this is showing you a female so you can see the bladder then leads into the urethra right so you can see in the female the urethra is really short and here we have an internal sphincter which is involuntary so you cannot control it but you know that if your bladder is full you can all control your urination for some time right you can hold it for some time so we also just like in the anal sphincters you had an involuntary and you had a voluntary sphincter so similarly here we have an external sphincter which is a voluntary sphincter because this is made of skeletal muscle so the external sphincter is skeletal muscle and this surrounds the urethra just before it opens so this is the one that you can control so let's answer this question knowing where the bladder is present damage to which of the following is most likely to injure the urinary bladder very good pubic symphysis the bladder is directly related to the pubic symphysis because it's anterior it's the rectum which is related to the sacrum and thoracic vertebra and ribs of course don't come into play at all so let's look at the nerve supply of the bladder and the process of micturition or the passage of urine so here the sympathetic and parasympathetic act hand in hand very similar to the digestive tract so here we saw that the bladder had this muscle wall called the detrusor and then at the bladder neck you had the involuntary sphincter which was smooth muscle so in this area we had the involuntary sphincter and then on the outside we had the external voluntary sphincter so let's see what happens the parasympathetic system the parasympathetic system is it causes contraction so it facilitates contraction so i'm going to go put a plus it causes contraction of the detrusor muscle but it relaxes the involuntary sphincter there's no point contracting the muscle and not relaxing the sphincter because otherwise urine will just keep staying in that right so it contracts the detrusor muscle and relaxes the involuntary sphincter the sympathetic system does exactly the opposite the sympathetic system relaxes the detrusor muscle so it relaxes detrusor the negative sign means that it doesn't stimulate it to so relaxes detrusor muscle but it contracts the sphincter so the sympathetic contracts the sphincter so when your bladder is filling you can understand the sympathetic will be active because it will keep the involuntary sphincter contracted and the the detrusor relax so your bladder can continue to fill right and then when your bladder fills to a certain extent the stretch reflexes will go and what they will do is they will stimulate the parasympathetic neurons in the sacral part of the nervous system those will come and they will cause contraction of the detrusor and relaxation of the sphincter so that urine can pass out and at the same time your external sphincter because it's voluntary it is supplied by somatic nerves so they will also need to relax so that you can completely void now so this is kind of like a local reflex the actual act of voiding is under control of the higher centers in the brain because it's not every time that your bladder fills and you have an urge to urinate that you immediately pass urine right so if the time and place is not proper what happens is the control center from the brain and spinal cord uh, 
upper centers from the pons they sort of inhibit these reflexes so you don't void so you know you stop it and then again the the bladder fills a little bit more again the reflexes go up and they ki kind of keep causing this till your bladder fills so much that you're no longer able to hold it we can hold about 500 ml of urine without feeling pain after that you you start feeling it becomes really painful and when it stretches too much sometimes you just can't hold it because you have what is called stress incontinence you know it just kind of flows out so let's look at this micturition the micturition reflex involves impulses traveling from the urinary bladder to the sacral region of the spinal cord and from the sacral region of the spinal cord back to the bladder it is coordinated by neurons in the spinal cord and can be influenced by signals from the brain when the urinary bladder becomes stretched there is an increase in the frequency of action potentials carried from the bladder wall to the sacral region of the spinal cord In response, parasympathetic neurons from the spinal cord to the bladder are activated, and this causes the smooth muscle on the bladder wall to contract. The sensory signals to the sacral region of the spinal cord also stimulate ascending pathways to the pons and cerebrum, which results in the conscious desire to urinate. If urination is not convenient at the time, The brain sends impulses down the spinal cord to inhibit the micturition reflex. Impulses carried via somatic motor neurons keep the external urinary sphincter contracted, which also prevents urination. When urination is desired, signals from the brain stimulate the micturition reflex. The brain also decreases action potentials in the somatic motor neurons to relax the external urinary sphincter. in children you must have noticed children have bed wetting problems or what is known as enuresis you know they can't they're not able to hold the urine that's because this higher center the micturition centers from the pons and the cerebral cortex they haven't yet established those pathways to control that that's why the moment their bladder fills they kind of can't hold it and they pass urine so let's look at this question what does passage of urine involve Well, most of you got it right. It is contraction of the detrusor and relaxation of the sphincter. You can't relax the detrusor and the sphincters. If you relax the detrusor, then urine will just remain there. You have to contract it to squeeze the urine out. Okay, which system causes contraction of the detrusor and relaxation of the internal sphincter? parasympathetic nervous system yes that causes contraction of the detrusor and relaxation you must know this nerve supply here let's look at the urethra so this begins at the bladder neck you know that area where the bladder is narrowed and continues into the urethra and it ends at the external urethral orifice you can see this is at the external urethral orifice the urethra has two sphincters The one on the top which is this one is the internal sphincter which is involuntary and then here this is the voluntary sphincter in and here you can see in females so this one is in males so the voluntary is called the external sphincter made of skeletal muscle the male urethra is much longer it's about 20 cm long the female urethra is much shorter only about 4 cm So in the males it's long because it has to pass through a number of structures so it is divided actually into three parts there's a part of the urethra which open which passes through the prostate gland and when we do the reproductive system you have to recall this so it's a good idea to remember it now so this passes through the prostate gland where it's called the prostatic urethra because remember in the males the urethra passes is a passageway for both sperm and urine So it's uh, it passes through the prostate so that the prostate also can pour its secretions and you can get this uh, we'll see later what is called the ejaculatory duct which pours sperms into it 
Then we have a part where it's passing through the uh, external sphincter where that part is known as the membranous part of the urethra or here what is labeled as the intermediate part is also known as the membranous part of the urethra. It's called membranous because there are two membranes which are above and below that external sphincter. And then it goes into the penis or what is called a particular part of the penis called the corpus spongiosum. So this part is known as the penile or spongy urethra. It's also known as the penile urethra. The part which is passing through this sphincter, that's the narrowest part of the male urethra. In the females, one doesn't have to worry so much of different parts. It's really the female counterpart is equivalent to these, this mainly this membranous part. The female urethra is only 4 centimeters long. Now, who do you think would be more prone to urinary infections and why? Very good. Yes, females, the, urine, the urethra is much smaller, very close because the urethra and the vagina both open into an area called the vestibule, which we'll see when we do the reproductive system. The vagina is full of bacteria. Our anal canal is very close by, so urinary infections are much calmer in, in uh, females, especially young girls uh, and young, you know, little girls, and also during sexual activity because the urethra gets bruised at that time, and so urinary infection tends to become more common in them. Here are some clinical conditions which are of interest. Urinary tract infection, which are UTI, stands for urinary tract infection, which I just said was more common in, in women. Uh, because of the proximity of the urethra to the anal canal and the vagina. Incontinence is a condition where you cannot control, or you cannot hold your urine, and so the sphincters sort of give way and, um, you know, urination follows. It could be because of numerous uh, situations. There could be something like a spinal cord injury which causes that. Some people may have emotional problems which um, lead to incontinence in children. We said, you know, they can't hold it because the pathways have not yet been established. So, you know, numerous causes for that. Then we might have stones, which are known as calculi. The calculi may be in the kidney. It may form in the kidney when we call it renal calculi or calculus for singular. It may travel from the kidney and go into the ureter where we call it a ureteric calculus. Or it may even go into the bladder and so then we will say a calculus in the urinary bladder and the one in the bladder is called a vesicle calculus. And usually when it is present in the ureter, it tends to block, as a, you know, you saw in that question, it will block the part just above. And here this is one um, a special study was done and here you can see just like a plain x-ray, you can see a little sort of area here. So this is where they suspected a ureteric stone is uh, was present. And then they injected a dye which was filtered through the kidney and they wanted to see, you know, is the dye going properly. So on this side, see it's gone properly. On this side, can you see this area seems dilated over here. So they, they knew then it was because of this obstruction by the renal calculus. Anything to do with the bladder, we either use the word vesicle or also use the word cyst, like a blood inflammation of the bladder, for example, is called cystitis. Um, so, uh, you know, you often want to kind of look inside the bladder to see if there is any problem. If somebody passes blood in the urine, which is passing blood in the urine is known as hematuria. So the hematuria could be because of many reasons. It could be because there's a stone somewhere and the stone as it's being passed out could scratch the mucosa or it could be bladder tumor which is causing, you know, it sort of bleeding and causing blood to be passed out. So you want to kind of look inside the bladder and see what's wrong. And you do the procedure of looking into the bladder is called cystoscopy. And I thought this would be an interesting video for you to look to see the trigone and see how the urethra is present. So let's take a look here. And it shows the bladder wall. 
here is being passed through the urethra. So it's a male urethra. So you can see it's long. And the part where it's going through the prostate gland. There's a little sort of ridge here. And then now this is the neck of the bladder. And then you're in the bladder. So look at this tiny orifice on this side. This is the trigone. Another tiny orifice there. And this is the rugae you can see in the bladder. And the rest of it is just showing you the wall and you can see some bits. Sometimes you'll have little things in it. And you can see the blood vessels through the mucosa which is why sometimes they can rupture and cause you know, hematuria or blood in the urine. And so, you know, so that's it's inside of the bladder. Okay, any questions?